Okay, good Friday morning, everyone. Welcome to the Urban Ecology Center's Backyard Naturalist Series. My name is Tim, and I'll be your host today for a look at, uh, I don't know, the most one of the most iconic represented, representatives of urban wildlife. Uh, when one thinks of animals that live in cities with humans, if this were a family feud question, I'm sure rats would be like one of the top survey says answers. Um, and oftentimes when I'm when I'm bringing a critter to this, uh, several of them, because they're urban wildlife, we tend to think of them as vile or dirty or dangerous. Um, but usually I come to the episode with this like the certain level of respect that I had already had you know, as a naturalist for these critters. And then I try to make it, you know, my goal to increase our collective respect for them. And, you know, I think of like opossums and spiders and yellow jackets. Um, but I do have to admit that for rats, I I did not, I, I'm embarrassed to say, I didn't have that level of respect. Um, I, I didn't really have a high regard for rats. I, maybe it's just my personal experience with rats in the wild, uh, my backyard, my my dog killing a rat and worried about the dog getting diseases, um, people putting out rat poison that ends up killing owls and eagles. Uh, not 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 the rat's fault, but um, you know, I, I rats have decided to install some additions to my garage floor that I I didn't approve of or appreciate, uh, both in how it looked and it smelled, and and uh, I, you know, I so I just. I just came to this like okay, I'm 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 sure there's some great stories here, um, but I I I I owe rats an apology, um, and I, I didn't come to that with this pre-episode respect, um, you know I didn't I didn't even treat this with the same level of kindness as uh, as that critter with a hundred legs, um, so I I'm I'm pleasantly surprised that I have found, I think that my level of respect for rats has just gone through the roof. Um, and uh, so we have some fascinating stories to tell. Uh, and and really part of it is just allowing ourselves to listen and uh, kind of take those, those cultural responses uh, out the window. One of the, one of the, I think it was National Geographic. We, we've all heard of uh, probably uh, flight or fight, they have oh, what's it called? It's um, uh, it oh shoot, what is it? Uh, it it's um squirm, or oh shoot, I'm sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna find it out. But essentially, it's it's that some sometimes cultural aspects of what we bring, uh, to animals just really really cloud how we think of them. So some somebody can look at a rat as just and have this re this gut reaction of of uh of being afraid or, or being disgusted by it and another culture can look at that and think food and another culture can look at that and think pet or respect um and so really our experiences are really influenced by our cultural experiences and um so that's a really kind of interesting way to to go into this so here we go it's uh, episode 22 of season four of Backyard Naturalist, Wild Rat Heart, or How I Learned to Gain a New Level of Respect for the Rodent that Poops in My Garage. Before we begin, once again, a thank you to, to everybody who has been involved with the Backyard Naturalist since it began in April of 2020. Uh, as a presenter, participant, someone who's watched the recordings, I really appreciate you all. Uh, uh, whether you're watching live, um, uh, I appreciate the little boxes on my screen that I get to talk to every morning. I appreciate your company, your conversation, and I appreciate most of all learning alongside you from you. Uh, and so just thank thank you to the current and past subscribers too, to the Backyard Naturals for your support. I'm always humbled. And I just want to remind everyone that tomorrow the Urban Ecology Center here in Milwaukee celebrates Winterfest at the Washington Park Branch. And I'm so happy that the last week brought us our first decent winter snow and, and that it got really, really cold. And it is really, really cold again, which means we've got almost a foot of ice on the lagoon, which means that this will be a proper winter fest with skiing and snowshoeing and ice skating, along with all the other great activities. So 
uh, doesn't happen every year. I hope you can pop over to Washington Park Urban Ecology Center sometime between 10 and 2 tomorrow for some good wintertime fun. And then in the news of the backyard skies, you may have heard of this green comet that we all should be looking for. Uh, it has a name that really rolls off the tongue. It's called C2022E3ZTF uh, because astronomers discovered it in March of 2022 using a telescope called the Zwicky Tra Transient Facility, ZTF. Um, and, you know, this is a this is a fascinating future topic. Uh, but in a nutshell, comets are clumps of frozen gas and dust. Sometimes astronomers describe them as dirty snowballs that originate in very, very far regions of the solar system. Uh, and gravity pulls them to the sun. Uh, they get knocked off course something. The heat then from the sun causes them to spew gas and dust in what we call a tail. Then that tail can stretch for millions of miles. It's pretty cool because when they're when they're far from the sun, they're just pretty much a rock, but then the sun kind of wakes them up, it excites them, it turns them into the comic, the comets that we see, these fascinating dynamic forms. And this particular comet is swinging through Earth's neighborhood for the first time in 50,000 years. So it's very likely that early humans would have seen it in the past, particularly because, you know, that was a time when we didn't have the modern human pollution, light pollution. Um, so nowadays it's much harder to, to observe these, but the, for the early humans, they would have seen it. And then yesterday on February 2nd, the comet came to the closest point of the Earth, which is about 26 million miles, or a little more than 100 times the distance of the moon. And if you want to look for it, your best bet is to find dark skies outside of the cities. Uh, bring a telescope or bring binoculars. Technically, it will be visible uh, with the naked eye, um, and but the binoculars or telescope would really help. And then it's this one's really nice. You just need to look north. It's it's currently conveniently positioned near the North Star, which makes it visible all night long. So you don't have to wake up at some crazy hour to see it, like you often do for for astronomical events. Um, and then the reason that this particular comet uh, is glowing green is because it has. Uh, molecules called diatomic carbon that absorbs UV radiation from the sun and emits it as green light. Unfortunately, we won't be able to see the comet as green, mainly because at such low light levels, our eyes aren't sensitive enough to, to pick up the green color. But if you have a camera and a long exposure, you, you can pick up the green color. So if you're into amateur photography and you have a tripod, this would be something uh, worth, worth giving a shot. And if, if you miss it over the next few days, that's okay. Uh, just it, especially since we're coming on a full moon, um, you might you might want to try again around February 10th because then it's going to be the moon is going to be a little bit better, a little less less light, and then it's also going to be swinging by Mars, which make which will make it easier to find it. Um, but even if you don't try to find it or photograph it, it's still pretty cool to think that the comets may have been responsible for seeding the early earth with the materials and building blocks for life. Uh, there are many who think we probably wouldn't exist if it hadn't been for comets. Um, and then an, uh, another fun thing is that they have such huge orbits that we don't know whether this comet will return again in another 50,000 years, or if this time the sun will fling it with enough force that it leaves the solar system entirely. So. Pretty cool event occurring right now. Okay, so we're we're talking about rats. Hey, uh, yeah. There's a question asking what what's the best place around here to look for the comet? Any anywhere you can get dark skies. So um, best, after, best dark place. Yeah, any any dark place, and and you know you can uh, you can talk to my dad later. Um, you can, you know, any astronomy organization, they, they probably have lists of places where you can go that you don't have to go too far to, to get the darker skies. Um, so, uh, good question. Okay. And that, you know, goes for wherever you are. Um, just, just getting to the darkest places you can. Okay. So rats are, I have learned, very complex figures with a long, complex relationship with our species with human beings. And when one says a rat, there are a lot of different species of rats around the world. 
A surprising number of them are threatened, found in only one location, uh, endangered. And the protagonist for this morning's story is the absolute opposite of threatened. It's, it's one of the most successful organisms on the planet. We call it the Norway rat. You might, there's a lot of names for it, brown rat. Uh, we'll look at some of those names. But the first thing that I noticed when I saw this is the Latin name. I love the Latin name. It, it, it kind of looks like the answer that an unprepared school kid would give if, if they were suddenly asked on a test. Okay, Jimmy, what's the Latin name of the Norway rat? And then little Jimmy blurts out the first thing that comes to their mind. Uh, okay, Latin name, Norway rat. Uh, Ratus norvegicus. So kind of makes it easy to remember uh, the Norway rat. And to better understand the Norway rat as we do, let's take a step back to look at the, at the rat family tree. We're gonna go all the way back quickly just cause it's fun to a group uh, that is very familiar to the backyard naturalist community, the order Rodentia, the rodents, largest group of mammals uh, and one that we are very familiar with. So in the archives, we have episodes on the American beaver, the Eastern chipmunk, the gray squirrel, the groundhog, uh, who just a few days ago told us we'd get six more weeks of winter. And in two weeks, we're gonna be featuring another rodent when we look at the fascinating and urbanizing porcupine, which is the third largest rodent in the world. Um, so it'll make a, a, a half dozen rodents that we've had since this began. Um, from the order, the rodent order, if we're going to go to the rat path, then the next thing that we come to is the family Myridae or the Myrids. This is the largest family within the largest order of mammals, uh, just shy of for, just shy of 1,400 species. Mice, rats, gerbils, uh, Siberian hamsters, uh, they're all the old world uh, Eurasian, African, and Australian. So this whole family, this whole large family does not have any native to the Americas. Um, and so yet some of the more prominent rodents of our houses and our backyards are a member of this family. So we have the house mouse, the black rat, the Norway rat, and uh, the little gerbil, little, little sniffy pink paws. So um, Muridae comes from the Latin murus, meaning mouse, and um, all of the true mice of the world belong to this family. So if you connect the dots, there are no true uh, mice native to the Americas, uh, but really there's just, uh, just these labels that we slap on the groups of animals. So in the end, it doesn't really matter that much um, unless you're on Jeopardy. So murids range from herbivores to omnivores to carnivores. Um, they, they specialize in things like earthworms or aquatic insects sometimes. There's some fungivore specialists, but for the most part, murids eat seeds and uh, small invertebrates. They tend to be short-lived, small, and prolific reproducers. The smallest is the African pygmy mouse, with a body size of less than two inches. And on my screen, at least, this mouse is shown in actual size. Uh, it probably isn't on your screen, but it probably is close. And then the largest member of this family, the southern giant slender-tailed cloud rat. It's a really long name, too. The body size is 19 inches long, so it, it, wouldn't, it, it can't fit on my screen. Uh, it'd be about twice as long as my, my screen. Uh, and that doesn't include the tail. So, um, you know, my, my screen is only about 13 inches wide, not diagonal. Uh, and, you know, holding this rat is pretty much like, like holding a pet cat. So um, this group has a prominent place in, in many of the, the written Western stories of the old world. Uh, they were already thought of as pests when you know, the, the Brothers Grimm and the Pied Piper and then, of course, the Beatrix Potter, you have Aesop's fables, Van Gogh um, novels. And then from this large group known as the Myrids, we head down the path that brings us to the made-up genus of Rattus, also known as the true rats, the old world rats, or just the rats. Uh, even though there are plenty of other animals that we call rats that are in other groups of rodents, but the rats in the Rattus genus tend to be larger, and then the, the best known species uh, 
at, at least from the Western human history, is the black rat and the Norway rat. But there are only two of 64 species in this genus of true rats. And again, many of them are, are threatened or endangered with, with very limited range ranges. Uh, they have names like Engano rat, Hoogerwerf's rat, the Moluccan prehensile tailed rat, the bulldog rat, the New Ireland forest rat, which unfortunately might be extinct, the sunburned rat, the nonsense rat, the little soft furred rat, the slender rat, and many more. And then we make our way to the species, the brown rat or the Norway rat. And its, it's long history with humans has given it many names. So brown rat, Norway rat, the sewer rat, uh, the, the common rat, the street rat, the wharf rat, the Parisian rat, the Norwegian rat, the Hanover rat. Its body length minus the tail is, is almost a foot. Um, and then the tail is almost as long as the body. The, the story, at least from you know, our written history begins, we, likely somewhere, in Asia, most likely somewhere in China, there is some debate depending on, on which source. Some, some say it involved in Northern China, in Mongolia, some say in Southwest China, Southeast China. Um, the, the house sparrow, the, the star of the very first backyard naturalist um, is very similar, it has a similar story to the, to the Norway rat. The Norway rat kind of put all its eggs, so to speak, in the human basket and tied its success to humans, as did the house sparrow. Um, so it, it adapted to living with humans and its evolutionary success followed the evol evolutionary success of Homo sapiens. So it didn't necessarily follow humans um, from the cradles of civilizations, but once it latched on in that area, um, then it started to follow humans and, and catch up with the other humans that are were in different parts of the world. Um, so just like the house sparrows, they spread across the globe to all the continents except Antarctica. Just like house sparrows, their, their distribution is tied very closely to the distribution of humans and human structures. For example, if, you, if you're taking a bird walk through Riverside Park and you're in the middle of the park and in, in the kind of that healthy forest community, uh, you don't find house sparrows there. And that's a place you're not going to find Norway rats. But if you go to the outskirts of the park, to areas where the human structures are, the houses, the warehouses, the factories, that's where you'll find house sparrows. That's where you'll find rats. Um, but with rats, we can take it a little further because unlike the house sparrow, rats are very good at living below ground. And so some of the favorite places for rats around the world are places like subways and sewers. They're very fond of wet urban habitats. They're quite an aquatic creature. Um, so one of the main ways that they have spread throughout the world was on ships from port to port, on trade routes. Um, so they would, you know, stow away on a ship uh, or, a, or a, a cart, taking advantage of the abundant food that humans leave for them, starting that uh, conflicting relationship with humans as kleptoparasites, as stealing is their kind of main way of, of uh, finding food. And um, but in other cases, sometimes, again, this is a cultural thing, humans brought rats with them to places uh, specifically as food. Uh, that, that sets up some conflicts in places like New Zealand, where uh, rats have caused a lot of uh, damage to native wildlife, yet there are um, cultural uh cultural issues, cultural uh, um, where people are, you know, rats is a, is something to be revered, something to be, um, you know, like uh, uh, respected. And so it, 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 it's, it sets up this unique way of, of uh, dealing with rats when you have cultural conflict. Um, so we have the rat, the first time we see it referenced in writing, uh, is called the Hanover rat, which indicates that our disgust with the rat goes back a long way because by naming the rat the Hanover rat, it was seen as a way to bring shame to the house of Hanover. Why it's called the Norwegian rat is also a mystery since there are no natural connections with the rat and the country of Norway. Um, but there is a, a book written in 1760 called Outlines of the Natural History of Great Britain. And the author 
surmises that the rat made its way to England via Norwegian ships in the early 1700s with no evidence. And yet the Norway rat name stuck uh, even as early as 1850. The connection is, is disputed by none other than Charles Dickens who wrote about the rat, uh, again, commonly called the brown rat. And he said, it is frequently called in books and otherwise the Norway rat. And it is said to have been imported into this country in a shipload of timber from Norway. Against this hypothesis stands the fact that when the brown rat had become common in this country, it was still unknown in Norway, although there was a small animal like a rat, but really a lemming, which made its home there. So the, the Norway rat, likely not even in Norway yet when it was given its name, and then the academics in Britain started to try to find the, the true origin of the rat. Uh, they guessed Ireland, Gibraltar, Paris, um, parts of Persia, but you know, today, when you take a worldview, the, the origin is, is very likely some part of China, Mongolia. Um, but from whichever parts of China it spread in waves, uh, the, the god Apollo was tasked with eradicating the rat. Um, and then as I kind of now take the leap into the rat world, uh, I'm reminded of, of how difficult it is for me to to put this rat story in a in a thirty minute episode, uh, I'm easily distracted by shiny things, so my mind bounces around quickly. And this rat story gave me just so many shiny things to move to, um, a lot of rabbit holes. And so I'll try to kind of move from topic to topic without getting too distracted. There's a lot that I'm not uh, including here, so yeah, maybe part two. But you know, first off, as the rat with the 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 many names that don't make much sense as it's spread around the world, they also began to take like a, a new role in their relationship with humans. And one of the ways they thrived was in the pet trade. This is taking that leap from disgust to, oh, this is really cute. And people began to breed rats just as they bred dogs and cats, selecting for desired traits, color, size, hairless, um, uh, the Dumbo rat, apparently the ears are lower and rounder, like the elephant. Uh, you have Himalayan and Dalmatian rats, Agouti rats, American blue. And, you know, there's a lot to unpeel here, to peel here. There's, uh, you know, the ethics of having pet rats. There's, uh, they were used in circus. They were used in, uh, in, in little, like, arcade machines where you could get rats to do tricks. Um, there's street performers and there's a there's also a, a, a dark origin of the rat pet trade which had its roots in in blood sport so people would collect rats uh put them in a in a pit and then bring along a rat terrier and time to see how long that or how quickly that rat terrier could kill all the rats so there is a a long and complex and, and dark history of the rat pet trade and domestication also led to the development of rats for research, uh, the origins of the lab rat, which also has its own deep set of ethical considerations, shameful practices. But as we shall see, um, this relationship has also deepened our connection with rats over time, and hopefully some, some good things will come of it. Uh, one of the most salient and reoccurring themes when you look at the rat is that We'll start, we'll start from this side. People, humans, uh, have the strong reactions to rats, and the most, the most dominant reaction is disgust. Um, and you know, I, I think one of the things that we that that is important to recognize is that rabbits, rats are vectors of diseases. Um, so the CDC website has a, a whole menu to follow, and they list. Hantavirus, pulmonary syndrome, hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome, Lassa fever, leptospirosis, lujo hemorrhagic fever, lymphocytic choriomeningitis, monkeypox, OMSK hemorrhagic fever, rat bite fever, salmonellosis, several South American arena viruses, and sylvatic typhus. So, I, you know, you, you can look at that list and think, oh, you know, that's this sucks. I really don't want to have anything to do with rats. Um, I hate them. But another kind of evolutionary way to look at this from, from the rat's perspective is like, okay, I'm one of the most successful animals on the planet. Uh, don't mess with me. 
I'm, I'm this badass sewer rat. Stay away from me because I can make your life a living hell. So I don't know. This is, a, this is the reality of living with rats. Um, and rats hold a lot of real estate around the world, uh, especially in cities. So in New York cities, they're, they're part of the landscape. They're thriving. Um, and the, the first thing I wanted to kind of clear the air about is that, yes, rats are excellent swimmers. Yes, rats are excellent at moving through tight spaces. They are excellent climbers. And yes, they can come up into your house through your toilet bowl. So this is where we'll take our first video break. I have to give you a warning if you become squeamish at extremely adorable images of swimming rats, this video might not be for you. It's an urban dweller's worst nightmare, a rat in the toilet. It's scary, but it does happen. Good afternoon, you reach rodent Washington, D.C.'s rodent control receives a couple of complaints each year. You have a rat in your toilet? How does this ultimate rat invasion actually occur? First, it could easily sneak into grates or manhole covers open to the street. Residential sewer pipes feed into the main tunnel. A rat might consider this path an irresistible opportunity for exploration. Its sharp claws allow the rat to scale almost any vertical surface. The rat is in the home's internal pipes, going up. Now it faces the biggest test, getting through the last few feet of the narrow, maze-like toilet pipes. Is this even possible? The underwater passage leaves no room for error. At a turn, the rat finds a pocket of air, just enough to help it push on to the end of the line. How does it collapse its body like that? Take a look at this rat's attempt to get to the other side of the tiny hole. If a rat can fit its head through an opening, the rest is easy because of its internal acrobatics. When squeezing through a constricted space, the pressure causes the ribs to give way. At the spine, the ribs are hinged, allowing them to effortlessly collapse. How does the rat deal with all that water? What if someone flushes? We think of rats as land animals, but it turns out they're expert swimmers. Rats paddle with their back legs while their front feet steer. The tail also works as a kind of rudder. Rats have incredible stamina. They can tread water for three days straight. And they can hold their breath underwater for up to three minutes. This aquatic proficiency is the very reason rats became global travelers. Long distance swimming enabled them to hitch rides on boats and colonize new shores. Okay, so it's an urban dweller's So rats, you know, they, they, uh, there's a, there's, oh, oh, really quickly, the, the flight or fight thing, I remembered it, it's squeal or a meal. So, uh, it's kind of like you see a rat and you either squeal or you look at it and think, oh, that's a meal. And, and so much of that is, is cultural and depends on how you, you react to certain things. Okay. So, uh, you know, so in, in New York city, they're part of the landscape and they're thriving there and and uh you know it's if you if you if you look at they're extremely intelligent they're extremely curious and we built them underneath New York City this basically this giant like Chuck E. Cheese style set of tubes for these rats to explore um you know part Chuck E. Cheese part like Kalahari water resort and 
So we're we're creating these spaces for rats, and uh, we're not going to really talk too much about rat eradication. But to get rid of rats, uh, you really have to. The only way to do that, according to the research, is to get rid of once you get them down to ninety six percent of what their original was, the original population was. Then you have a chance of getting rid of the rest of the four percent. But if you leave it at ninety five or ninety four, that the, the, they're going to come back. Um, with force. So they're really, really hard to eradicate, even though there's this multi-billion dollar industry. Um, so we estimate that there's somewhere between two and 28 million rats in New York City. If we take the halfway estimate of 18 million, that means there's two rats for every human in the city, uh, and they're thriving. And then if we if we start to think now about our relationship with with rats, this may be the most important fact of any in this whole story. We're learning more and more that rats are a lot more like humans than we would probably care to admit. And some of this we're, we're learning about them is we're only getting this information within the last few years. Uh, they don't look like us, but the rat brain and the human brain are wired in very, very similar ways. So, so, so because of that, uh, studying rats has given us a lot of insight into the human mind and human health. 95% of all lab animals are mice and rats, um, mostly because they're small and very easy to maintain. They adapt quickly to living in captivity. They reproduce like crazy. Uh, one pair of rats can produce 15,000 offspring in one year. And because they only live for two to three years, they're also really good for generational studies. They're, they're cheap, you can buy them in bulk, they're portable, uh, and they have a, a generally mild temperament. But the most important thing is that their genetic, biological, and behavioral characteristics very closely resemble humans. So uh, the biggest contributions they've made over the decades is in informing human research on diseases. We've learned a lot about a laundry list of human conditions because of our work on rats. So this includes hypertension, diabetes, cataracts, obesity, seizures, respiratory problems, deafness, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, cancer, cystic fibrosis, HIV, AIDS, heart disease, muscular dystrophy, spinal injuries. Uh, they've, they've added to our knowledge of behavioral issues, sensory issues, aging, nutrition, drug addiction, genetic studies. There are a lot of lab rats in the world that have unwittingly, unwillingly contributed just a ton of knowledge that is useful to you and me and our health. So maybe just just from that, you know, in in my mind when I see a rat, maybe the, that's the first thing I should think about rather than reacting with disgust. And and it's something that I don't feel particularly good about, uh, especially since we've learned just how intelligent, how social, and how emotional rats are. So we're we're probably more familiar with some of the the behavioral studies, the rats in a maze, studying intelligence and and motivation to receive a treat, and then just adding a few layers to this knowledge. If you don't believe me that rats and humans are alike, uh, the treat that is most sought after by rats above just about everything else is chocolate. It drives them bonkers. Uh, unlike dogs, they can digest the theobromin, uh, and just like with humans. Um, you know, a little bit is good for them. A lot is not good for them. So uh, it, it it triggers the same pleasure sensors as it does with humans. And that's, you know, this is one of the most amazing things we've learned is that rats demonstrate metacognition. They think about their thinking. They reprocess information, which, you know, for many years was was how we separated humans from the animal world. Uh, but now we know there's there's several animals, including rats, that that uh, think about their thinking. And so if rats are presented with boxes and they have different treats in them and and there's a demonstrated spectrum of yumminess. So, you know, you have chocolate as kind of the top and then you have the cherry and banana and have different levels of of motivation to eat them. And you have unflavored treats which, you know, if you're hungry, you'll eat, but it's just not going to be as, as, as pleasurable. It's like, you know, eating a wheat thin versus a, a cookie. Um, I actually, I like wheat thins, so I don't know why I said that. Uh, but when, when, when researchers add an element of time 
a, a rat can easily be trained to associate a tone with a wait time. So it's kind of like the, uh, uh, you can eat one marshmallow now, or you can wait and eat two marshmallows, but, but um, if, if they're trained to associate the tone with the wait time, if they hear one tone and it's, it's next to a box with a treat, they know that they can get that treat right away. That's gonna be instant, uh, you know, instant gratification. If a, if a treat that they might like better is associated with a different tone, they've associated that tone, they know they have to wait uh, either a short or a long period of time. Um, researchers have shown that if, if the rat does that impulsive behavior and favors that short-term reward, say they're really hungry, they know they can get that cherry in three seconds, but to get the chocolate, they'd have to wait a minute. And if they say, fine, I'll get the cherry because I know I can get it shortly. The rats also show this very human trait of regret. And it's not just, and, and the same areas of the brain that are triggered in rats when they experience regret are the, the, those are the same areas in human brains, brains that are triggered when we express regret. So it's not just that they look like they're behaving like humans, their brain uh, is, it's very likely a, a, they're experiencing similar things. So then the past regret, often unlike with humans, that past regret will influence future choices. They reprocess that information just as humans do. Um, if they weren't happy with the choice, that will influence their future choice. So this rat's thinking, okay, these rice cakes were okay. They're filling me up, but oh, if I would have just waited another 20 seconds, I could have gotten that Hershey's bar. So rats show regret. And even more amazing to me, and, and maybe this is the take home of the episode, Rats show a strong sense of empathy, and that's, you know, that's a trait I strongly value. If a rat is introduced to an environment and another rat is trapped in a cage, inevitably they, they learn that if, if they learn they can free that rat, they will do so. Um, and if they are familiar with that other rat, like it's a companion, some, some, a, a rat that they've been in captivity with before, they don't even think about it. They immediately release it. Once they learn, they can release it and they know who's in that, they'll immediately release it. If they, if it's an unfamiliar rat though, they don't do it immediately. And that's probably an adaptive trait. Um, you know, maybe they're thinking, could this rat hurt me? Uh, you know, it, it's new. So there's hesitation. It's not like I'm immediately going to release it. Um, but even with the unfamiliar rats, um, they do release them from their cage. And if it's a fake rat, if it's a pretend rat, they don't even like try. So now if you add the element of reward, they enter the cage. Now there's two things here. There's a caged rat and a piece of chocolate. Uh, they both need to be released. Um, so then what do you do? I, I really want this chocolate. Here's this rat that's stuck in a cage. Without failure, the rat will first release the captive rat and then release and share the chocolate. Um, so you, you just can imagine that there's internal struggle, right? I can either eat this chocolate and not worry about this rat. Uh, I can eat the chocolate and then release the rat and then I don't have to share it. But no, I'm going to release the rat and that means I only get half of the chocolate. So there, there is this strong sense of empathy. Again, it triggers the same areas of the brain. There is an interesting caveat too though, if it's another species of rat, they often will eat the chocolate first unless they've had companionship with that rat, even if it was a different species. Um, so if, if, it, if it comes in a different species of rat and it knows that rat, it will first release the rat and then share the chocolate. And so, boy, there's a lot of like, you know, when think of it with humans, uh, if we're exposed to diversity, our, our, our sense of showing empathy to people that look different from us, you know, is really like, is bound to increase. Um, but again, it's not just, it's not just in the behavior, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's wired in the brain. Um, another experiment that demonstrated metacognition had to do with a reaction reward experiment. So rats were trained to associate the duration of a tone with a reward. So, for example, they may learn that if I hear a short tone come from a box, that box is going to have a big treat. 
if there's a long tone coming from the box, that box is going to have nothing at all. So they're presented with two boxes. Uh, one box has a big treat. The other box has no treat. If they push one lever, they hear the tone. If they push a different layer lever, the box opens. But once you open the box, you can't open the other. So you either get a big treat or no treat. They are able to master this very quickly. First, they listen to the tone of the box. If it's a long tone, uh, you know, or listen to the, you know, the other box, if it's a short tone, they know which one of those is going to have the big treat. Open the box, get the big treat. But there's a third option. If the rat does nothing after a period of time, a medium sized treat or a smaller treat comes out and they get to eat it. So now the options are open the correct box, get the big treat, open the wrong box, get no treat, or just open neither box and get the small treat. And, and time after time, if the duration of the tone is obvious, the rat always masters it, gets the big treat. But then if the scientists introduce ambiguity, if they're able to disguise the length of the tone or lengthen the short tone or shorten the long tone, if you introduce uncertainty, then the rats start to decide to open neither box and get the small treat. Like, I'm really not sure which one of these um, is going to win, so I'm not going to do it, and I'm going to get that consolation prize. So this, this metacognition, thinking about their thinking and adapting to new situations. And then the final experiment that I absolutely love uh, is, is that scientists have shown that rats have a similar relationship to being tickled as humans do. Um, a, a lot of rat communication happens in the ultrasound and frequencies higher than humans can hear. And we're able to eavesdrop on that ultrasound communication and discover that when rats are frolicking and playing, when they're playing with their companions, they elicit this very high ultrasound chirp that functions very similar to a human laugh. Uh, researchers also soon discover that they can elicit that sound by tickling the rats. So for the purposes of this, We'll call it a laugh because not only do they make the sound when they're playing or being tickled, when they make that sound, the same areas of their brain are firing as when humans laugh. And then the so then that you know they, the fun really begins, and it's really fun to read these uh, these scientific papers of 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 how you can get our you know the the description of how you can tickle the rats to elicit a greater um, response. If a rat is being housed alone it seeks out tickling from researchers more. So that one gets me a little bit. Uh, it, it's, there, you know, that loneliness of wanting to have that. Um, and then if, if a researcher tickles a rat, that elicits play biting from the rat to the researcher. And then rats that are relaxed laugh more than rats that are stressed. So if you have a really stressed out rat, it's almost impossible to elicit this behavior. And, you know, that's, seems very similar to human relationships with tickling. It's a very tenuous thing, right? Sometimes can, tickling can be wonderful. Sometimes it can be awful. Um, you know, it depends on so much of, of, of your state of being. So rats and humans are, are very similar in this way. So uh, as we kind of just wrap this up, I just, it, important to reflect on how humans view other animals, how we have this hierarchy for most of our history, at least in the Western world, I should say, I know many other cultures have a much more uh, respectful egalitarian relationship with the natural world, but in the Western world, there's this strong idea that humans are separate from all other animals. We're the only animals that can do this and that. we kind of had this fortress of consciousness. Uh, then pretty soon we say, okay, well, some of these great apes display behavior that start to break down these barriers using tools, metacognition. Okay, so great apes can come in, but we're still separate from the other animals, but oh, okay, we, we see that elephants show self-awareness and then, and dolphins show metacognition and crows show grief. And then slowly these barriers are just crumbling and, and, and you know, then you start to, to with octopuses and, and even plants, like you start to, you realize that, that these barriers are just nonsense. And um, so we, we have a long way to go. It's really sad to think that rats and mice that are bred for research are not technically considered animals and they can be subject to very inhumane conditions. And, and yet we know that they're highly intelligent, highly emotional, very similar to humans. Um, so, at, you know, at the end of the day, just I think for humanity's sake, it's just important to realize that we're, we are just slightly more complex than a lot of these other animals, including rats. Um, they're, they're conscious and, and aware and, and show emotions very similar to us. 
And, you know, I think they have lessons for us to learn in terms of empathy. Uh, and that brings us to um, the other animals, the beetles, the worms. Is it okay for us to mistreat them just because they're less like us than a, than a chimpanzee? Um, and at a time when the human race could certainly use some lessons from the animal world. Um, and it's especially important to start thinking about a relationship with rats because, you know, some scientists are actually starting to think about this post-apocalyptic world after humans go extinct and they're, they're, they're putting their money on rats. Uh, getting rid of rats is a huge industry, um, but, but we're not making a dent. And, and after humans go away, there's, you know, some, some are putting their money on the cockroaches, others are putting on the rats. And they're saying, once the humans are out of the way, the, the rats are gonna get bigger and smarter and kind of lead the way to the next round of evolution. So you could just imagine some, some bigger rats, rats studying these fossil humans and, and putting our bones in museums like we do with dinosaurs and, and wondering what led to the catastrophic extinction of, of such a dominant life force. And so I'm just gonna end quickly with two moments of Zen. Um, the first is the, the, the pandemic situation and, and, and there are some really interesting studies on how the pandemic has affected rats, particularly in New York cities. Um, but this is one of the most uh, famous viral videos that, that came out of the pandemic. Live your best life. And then, Live your best life. we have this little moment of Zen. Edgar. He's like this puppy that loves to be cuddled. Edgar. I'm Kimberly, and this is a story about Edgar and Fergus for GeoBeats. I got Edgar and Fergus in February 2021. Are you enjoying your donut, Edgar? Fergus. I really liked having small pets. Just where I am in life right now, it doesn't uh, make sense to have a dog. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so cute. Edgar. <laughs> I know people use the term heart rat to describe their one rat they're most connected to, but I feel that I have different types of bonds with each of them. You guys are way too fat. <laughs> Edgar definitely knows his name. Edgar? Edgar. Edgar. Oh, thank you. Edgar's a ball of energy. And now he is more cuddly with age, but he's still always up to no good. Oh my gosh. <laughs> no! He likes to establish that he's the alpha of the group. <laughs> Here they go. So he'll pick a fight with Fergus, a playful fight, just kind of pin him down and just blast him around. <laughs> he walks like he owns the place. Edgar. Edgar. Fergus. Fergus, ever since day one, was just full of love. Fergus. He's always making really intense eye contact. He just will stare you down until you pick him up. And he almost looks like he's smiling, too. Thank you. Good day. Thank you, sweetie. He wants to cuddle all the time, whereas Edgar wants to cuddle only when he's in the mood to cuddle. They know where in the kitchen the treats are kept. <laughs> so if I'm standing over there, they come running up to my, my feet and start trying to climb up my legs. They are just so clean. That's been a pleasant surprise. Edgar and Fergus seem to be absolute best friends, absolutely love each other. You guys are so cute. They know when they're breaking the rules and they run around together very sneakily. They're on a secret mission all the time. <laughs> People think rats are gross or, or scary, but they're just the sweetest little creatures. Hi guys. They make me smile every day.
So the next time you see a rat, uh, you know, what's your reaction going to be? It's probably hard to, to change some of the hard wiring we have when we see them. And I'm, I'm still not excited about uh, what they leave in my garage, although there's a lot of information that they leave for each other uh, in their excrement, too. So that's something maybe to, to think about. But, uh, you know, just from a from whether it's my backyard or or the world uh, that we live in and 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 how we treat each other, there's just uh, there's so much depth to to rats, and uh, I'm just really glad um, that I took this journey. And thank you for taking it with me. And I will stop sharing my screen.